I like to think of it in, in two different directions in terms of cultural fluidity. One of the things I love to talk about is, is uh, the idea of pajamas. And you're thinking, why would you like to talk about pajamas? Well, the word pajama comes from, the idea of pajamas in the word itself comes from India. And we all think of pajamas as the thing we put on when we don't have to go out anymore and we're going to sleep. You know, it's like, it's like, okay, I'm putting my pajamas on, that means, or it's a lazy Sunday, I'm not getting out of my pajamas. The word is actually, where it comes from is that British officials who first went to India starting in the 18th century with the East India Company, they wore British clothing which is made for a much colder climate. So when you show up in, you know, India and it's 100 degrees and humid and you've got four layers of coat on, you know, you're, you're going to faint. So even though your requirement said you had to dress in proper clothing, the British weren't stupid. They were like, you know, these Indians, know they, they get it. They're wearing thin cotton clothes. And the name was, it's not the only name, but pajama was a name for that. And so the reason we think of it as sleepwear, whereas it's just considered, you know, temperature appropriate clothing in India, is because the British officials could only wear it when they were off the clock or in the privacy of your home because you couldn't wear it to work. You couldn't dress Indian to go to work. And so, you know, on the one hand, we import that. We just call them pajamas. But in fact, in India, it's like, well, well the pajamas are just what you wear everywhere. So, you know, Indians know this and they're always frustrated that other people don't know that. So there, there's cultural fluidity that goes out of India. And there's stuff that comes back in, and you know, one of the classic examples of that is cricket. Um, that is a British sport. That is a colonial sport. But if you are in India, nobody sees it that way. Nobody's like, we should, we should not play cricket. We should get rid of this colonial legacy. It's like, it's, it's Indian. It's just, it's, it's ours, and we're going to play it as we want. And nobody has a problem with that whatsoever. I mean, I, I define popular culture in terms of accessibility because the whole point of popular culture is that anyone can, under, it's readily graspable. You know, it doesn't take years of study. It doesn't even take, uh, in many cases, literacy. It's just something that you can immediately uh, engage with. And the reason I, I, I focus on the accessibility is because I, I, I think by focusing on high culture versus low culture, we, we assume that popular culture has a lower status or is less important when in fact it can be even even more important than what we consider normally high culture or literate culture which reaches a smaller audience. It is separated into regions but you know you know, Dangdut interestingly is, is kind of a even though it's considered Indonesian music it is a fusion of Indonesian styles of music along with Arab styles of music and kind of Bollywood and in India, the kind of example of that, because Dangdut is considered popular music in, in Indonesia, is actually Bollywood song. So Bollywood song, the, the best Bollywood films have music that's so good that you just want to hear the music. Um, and so there are, class, usually because they're regional languages, people will know them. Like the movie, I, I mentioned the director, Mani Ratnam, for instance. And he, the guy that writes the music, A.R. Rahman is his name, um, the soundtrack from Roja became its own bestseller. I mean, people knew those songs. If you were in India when that film was out, every radio station, every house was blaring some song from that soundtrack. Um, and, and it really does have a unifying role because even if, even if you're not a Tamil speaker, they, they get dubbed a lot. So, you know, people will say, oh, that's a Hindi film. It's like, no, it was originally a Tamil film. They just dubbed it, you know, the song was dubbed. They had Hindi singers re-sing it with different lyrics. Um, and so, that is kind of the equivalent of Dangdut, you know, just a well-made, um, you know, if you mentioned the train song, which I talked about, everyone in India knows that, not, not just the song, but they know the video. You just have to say the train song and everybody knows. No one's going to be like, what's that? Everybody just knows. And so it has the same kind of popular culture uh, unifying thing that Dangdut has in Indonesia. It used to always be the difference between, there was Bollywood, which was the song and dance thing. There was, a, there was formulaic, and they, they tend to be quite long. I mean, Bollywood films can be four hours long. You know, you got to get those, and sometimes they even have music routines that have nothing to do with the, the film. They're just like, we need we need something here. Every 20 minutes, we got to have something. Um, it used to be between the Bollywood style film versus what I called serious cinema, which is probably the wrong word because it just means there's no song and dance. And for a long time, that was just considered. It was already considered kind of more cerebral. And Satyajit Ray was was I use that example because he's a very well known director. But even within India, it was just like. Nobody saw his films. They might know who he is, but it's like, I, I'm not going to see that film because I just, that's not my interest. 
Uh, now what you're getting is you're getting you know new formats. You're getting dramas on TV. They're kind of picking up on newer formats that may not have you know song and dance things in them, but they will be modeled on popular formats. You know, kind of like how Game of Thrones has this ongoing thing, or you have the, the you know in, in, like Korean dramas tend to be one season. You'll get like 16 episodes, and you see some of those now uh, happening in India. So you, you're getting different you know different formats different visual formats and also different audio formats depending on on, on you know what's happening and nothing is really broken uh, broken down directly the, you know the, the the kind of prestige of bollywood style films in popular culture but slowly people are kind of you know realizing there's there's different ways to do things they're they're, they're even doing experimenting with things like netflix style things where private companies are just saying let's do a 12 episode one off one season kind of thing so um, and again, all of these translate readily into South Asian culture just because they've been doing this for thousands of years. The idea of translating things in a new format makes perfect sense. It, you know, it, it's, it's a highly controversial question, even here in the United States. There's, there's a controversy even right now going on where um, you know, Americans of South Asian descent want people to change that to Indian descent because they argue that it used to all be India. I think it's a questionable argument at best, but whether you call it India or South Asia, I think what happens is, is if you don't know the entire region, it's easy to think that if you see a Bollywood film, that's kind of representative of everything. And you know, people say, well, you know, in America we have regional cultures. There's Texas versus California. The differences in South Asia are like confusing, um, you know, San Francisco with Buenos Aires. You know, like, oh, I, I saw San Francisco. I don't need to go to Argentina. It's like, yeah, they're very different. I mean, it, it, to go from North India to South India alone is, is literally like going into an entirely different country. So a tremendous amount gets lost if you don't understand that local popular cultures have dominated for most of history. And they can be, ex even with the same story, there can just be extraordinarily different versions of it in the way it's understood, the way it's interpreted, the way it's presented, and all sorts of things like that. So I, I, think, it's, I think part of understanding popular culture in South Asia is to understand that diversity. We want to believe that chai is a special kind of tea, so we call chai, you know, chai tea is the spicy tea, whereas it's just because you don't know the word. Chai is tea. You know, it comes from the Chinese word, which is cha. Um, and our word tea comes from chai, so it's, I think it's just one of these things. And, the, and this is, you know, partly the project of, of, of of India projecting its popular culture is this idea of, of, of breaking down stereotypes and correcting those things. That it's not chai tea, that we don't call it chai tea, it's just chai to us, and so it should be chai to you as well. And it's not a cultural appropriation thing where they're angry at people, they're just trying to correct it. Soft power is, is, is always the thing that countries project. So soft power is a very political science-y term these days, but it's, it's, it's taking, on, taking off in other fields. And so the idea is that, you know, how do countries project their image to the rest of the world? And it used to be you were a superpower, and superpower always meant you had a big military. Uh, other countries, for instance, Japan is one of the first countries that their soft power is really a projection of their economic strength. They didn't have a military really to speak of, but everybody knew Japan as this place that had just really transformed their economy, and so the Japanese economy was its own calling card. South Korea was kind of the first country to turn popular culture into a calling card through K-pop, you know, pop music in Korea. And the idea was, once you know Korea for this, you'll want to know lots of other stuff about Korea. You might want to do business in Korea. It puts, it puts a country on the map. And the reason it's called soft power is that it does so in a way that is not threatening to anyone. So it's considered a form of power because it enhances the prestige of a country on the international stage, but it's not done through um, you know, military strength, through things that would otherwise threaten other countries.